On the morning of January 15, 1976, little Joe Hooper left his home in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and headed for his new job at the Jupiter Chemicals construction site. Joe Hooper made it to work, but he never made it home. The assault on the Jupiter Chemicals construction site left little Joe dead, and it left behind a grieving widow and two small children. And who was this ugly mob of some 100 men who stormed the trailer and slaughtered little Joe Hooper? Were they racial bigots wreaking havoc? Were they a vigilante group seeking revenge? Neo-Nazis? No. They were union militants from local affiliates of the AFL-CIO, 100 union toughs who had decided to, quote, go out and beat on, end quote, some of the men at Jupiter Chemicals. Men like little Joe Hooper, whose only crime was that he had joined a small independent union, that he wasn't a member of the giant federation. Compulsory unionism violence, a tragic fact of modern American life. Where did it start? And more importantly, where and when will it finally end? Today, the union hierarchy goes to virtually any extent, legal or not, to force workers into its ranks. But it wasn't always that way. In 1916, Samuel Gompers, the founder of the American Federation of Labor, said, the workers of America adhere to voluntary institutions in preference to compulsory systems, which are held to be not only impractical, but a menace to their rights, welfare, and their liberty. With volunteerism as its guiding light, the union movement grew in size and favor. But by the late 1920s, Gompers was gone. The new union hierarchy quickly cast aside the tradition of volunteerism. They turned instead to the federal government and demanded legally sanctioned powers of compulsion, and the government responded on cue. In 1935, a union-dominated Congress passed the Wagner, or National Labor Relations Act. Sponsored by Senator Robert F. Wagner, a longtime ally of the union hierarchy, the NLRA made the closed shop the law of the land. Now, workers either joined the union, or they joined the unemployed. Armed with the unique power of compulsion, many of the new union professionals dropped the trappings of service, and they took up the scepter of violence. Finally, in 1947, Congress, reacting to public pressure, passed the Taft-Hartley Act. But most of the changes were more cosmetic than real. It still allowed the union shop to deny wage earners their right to work. So Congress had allowed compulsory unionism the root cause of union violence to remain virtually untouched. Without a ban on compulsion, union violence raged unabated. So in 1957, Senator John McClellan began two years of congressional hearings into the cause and extent of union violence. And a stunned Senate racketeering committee listened as victim after victim told tales of beatings, bombings, and murder. The evidence was overwhelming, over 50 volumes in all. 
And McClellan himself later concluded, compulsory unionism and corruption go hand in hand. Many Americans now expect a Congress to end once and for all big labor's special powers of compulsion. But that was not to be. Despite the massive evidence, the McClellan hearings produced little to check union violence. And today, the situation is worse than ever. Neil Martin is a man who knows how it feels to have had a rendezvous with death. Martin exercised his right to work during a militant trucker strike. As a result, he was brutally beaten by Union Tufts and left permanently disabled with psychomotor epilepsy. One of them come around, had a picket sign in his hands. At that time, he tried to knee me in the groin area. He kneed me once. And I got rid of my hand truck, and he needed me again. And at that time, he looked like he was going to hit me with a picket sign. So I decided that, you know, I better do something. So I backed up to get a little room. And when I did, I bumped into a guy on this side of me, on the right. And immediately I knew I'd been set up. I turned to the left, and when I did, there was a guy coming around with a stick from a picket sign like this. And he hit me in the head. At that time, I went down to the ground on my knees. I didn't go unconscious, but I went down. As soon as I hit the ground on my knees, the guy in front of me with the picket sign kicked me in the stomach. And I went over face first into the asphalt, busted my nose, started bleeding. And then they started kicking me in the side of the head and kicking me in the ribs and in the ear and neck. My doctor has described what I have as psychomotor epilepsy. Uh, go into an epileptic seizure, uh, bite my tongue, bite my gum, my mouth, inside of my mouth. Uh, I pass out on the floor, kick. Uh, I'm out for about 15 seconds, 30 seconds. But I'm out for about two hours afterwards, which I usually sleep. As for the guys that did it, they got off scot-free. Why not? Because the union paid for it. The union got lawyers. The union bought everything. That's pitiful. You smash a guy's head. You kick him in the face. You bust him all up. And the union says, well, because we got money in. That's the way it is. So they let him go. As for me, here I am now, five years later. I can't get a job in this town because of the union activities. I don't have a driver's license. I can't drive around. I have all kinds of problems. I have to take all kinds of medications. Uh, what can I do? I can't get a job. I can't do anything. I'm, I'm, I'm screwed for life. Terry Deloche and Karen Cerritos learned firsthand about the evils of compulsory unionism. When they went through the union boss to find waitressing work, he had other jobs in mind. And when they repelled his advances, he turned to threats of violence. He says, well, that's all you have to do is to waitress topless and you make $500. He says, if you want to make more money, you can make more money by doing more. And I said, no, I don't think I could do that. And he had a, some friend over in San Francisco who wanted to take pictures of women in lingerie. He had a woman in Hawaii who needed a live-in roommate. She happened to be lesbian, but she could get me a good job over there as a waitress. There was um, a dog act in Las Vegas. For the entire luncheon, ran down to me prostitution jobs, everything from uh, having sex with uh, politicians and underworld characters to having sex with dogs and lesbians. I couldn't do anything about his remarks. I couldn't do anything about having to pay union dues to a union that would do nothing to help me at all. There was nothing I could do about it. This is the way life is. There's nothing you can do about it. You just get through, get by. Don't make enemies out of this guy, because he can kill you. Mr. Lane sent someone out to talk to me about, uh, about um, quieting down a little bit. Lane. Oh, well, this, this gentleman came out and said if I didn't stop it, stop my protest, I would lose my job. Um, he said I would be blackballed in all the restaurants of Oakland, and I didn't do anything. I kept protesting. He came out again and said I would, uh, I would have my brakes slashed. He said I would be beaten up, and I still didn't do anything. I didn't stop. Um, and I didn't retract a letter to the International that they wanted retracted. Then he came out again and said that if I didn't stop, I would be raped. And after that, he said I would be killed. The kinds of union abuses that Terry and Karen had to endure were possible for only one reason. Union jobs. The law requires that you go through the union to get a job. One of the uh, union stewards shouted to 
Shut up and sit down or I'll ram this beer bottle down your throat. Before joining the Ralston, Nebraska police force, Dale Richardson was a loyal union member and a factory shop steward. But when he questioned the union's lavish spending, Richardson learned how dangerous it can be to cross a union boss. The local president of the union had told several other members uh, to do anything they wanted short of murder and the union would protect them. My wife was called during the night hours frequently and threatened. Uh, our tires were slashed on my car. Uh, numerous phone calls uh, just as a harassment during the middle of the night, all night long, particularly on weekends. This went on for about nine months uh, after uh, some time the Uh, I, I got harassment daily at my workbench. I had nuts and bolts thrown at me. All in all, it was a pretty terrifying period of time in my life. I was frightened most of the time because I could see that Dale was upset. He didn't talk about it, but he'd come home and he'd sit and watch out the windows for people. And uh, I'd ask him how it was going at work. and. He'd get real short with me and say, you know, don't ask. If you don't want to know. I planned this one birthday party for him. I was going to surprise him. And uh, he'd come home very upset. And somebody had told him to enjoy it because it would be the last one he ever had. Ramona Drobina and four female friends decided to return to work rather than support a strike they felt was immoral. The primary issue was rehiring a local union official fired for beating up on the company vice president. When Ramona and her friends crossed the picket line, they learned that the union boss's wrath knew no bounds. A few weeks later, one of the women that had crossed the picket line called me and told me that her home had been shot up. That about, uh, altogether about seven shots had been fired into the house and three of them went through her baby's bedroom window. And I went out there saw what they'd done. It, it ripped the baby's bed to shreds. It broke a big mirror, you know, that was close to the bed, and another slug had gone all the way through into the den. And I was just, I couldn't believe it. I, would, oh, I thought, if they will go so far as to fire shots into someone's home knowing that they could kill someone, you know, what else could they do? After the shots had been fired into the home, and they told me that they would get me. I'd have to go out alone sometime. Being pregnant, I was just, I was so afraid that I was gonna lose my baby. I just, I didn't have any peace. I was upset constantly. I just knew I was gonna lose her. I just couldn't take anymore. It just one thing after another. I couldn't sleep at night, and I woke up with nightmares, and, the thought of losing my baby was just, you know, it was too much. I knew that they were trying to more or less kill me, the way I felt, because, uh, I mean, there just wasn't no letting up. Sammy Kirkland, the father of two sons and a young daughter, was brutally beaten by union thugs for working without a union card. Though now back at work, Kirkland lives with the constant knowledge that he may still face corrective surgery that could leave him crippled for life. About 11 o'clock, when I was working at 11.30, about 100 men come through the gate, and they approach me and run up at the machine. I jumped off the machine, and when I did, they grabbed me and started beating on me and everything. They hit me with a ball peen hammer and a crescent wrench in the head and uh, throwed metal shavings in my eyes and threatening to cut my hands off and just kicked me and beat me all over my body and my head and busted ruptured the eardrum and... Uh, broke three ribs. One of them, they said, almost got a lung, you know, just nipped the lung, and uh, my kidney swole up. I was out of work from the beating for a year and a half before I could even get around. When I first saw him, I cried. He looked uh, just beaten down. 
Yeah, I knew he was scared. And I knew he was hurting. He was in quite a bit of pain. I had always heard the union was supposed to be so good. Well, what good is it if it's going to hurt people and their families? We wish we could tell you that what happened to these people were isolated incidents, that they were mere exceptions to the rule. But the rule of compulsory unionism violence knows no exceptions. It's as pervasive as it is perverse, as widespread as it is deep-seated. New York City, February 21st, 1979. Bands of striking school bus drivers attack private taxis. The union bus drivers wield baseball bats and ice picks. The cabs carry physically handicapped children to special schools across the city. Memphis, Tennessee, July 1st, 1978. While Memphis burns, striking union firefighters walk off their jobs. Mass tickets block fire station driveways. Tires are slashed on fire department vehicles. In just three days, over 300 fires caused $3 million worth of damage. And the Memphis police chief says he believes union firefighters set 90 to 95 percent of the blazes. Oakland, Alabama, February 4th, 1978. State police come to the rescue of seven non-union miners besieged by over 200 United Mine Workers Union militants. For 12 hours, the union mob attacks the embattled defenders with guns, clubs, chains, and dynamite. Monticello, Georgia, May 1980. Carol Ellis Fuller sleeps in the bedroom of her mobile home. Carol is a non-striking secretary at a local plywood plant. Suddenly, five rifle shots shatter the night air, and one lodges in the head near the left eye of the sleeping bride. Brooklyn, New York, April 1980. 1,000 striking Union militants stormed the Hyam Solomon home for the aged. The Union mob rings bricks and bottles on the nursing home's defenders. As they batter down the door, the terrified aged patients cower in their closets and hide under their beds. The stories of Union violence are as numerous as they are numbing. Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, October 1978. A mob of union toughs attack a group of workers at the Wilkes-Barre Publishing Company. When a police officer tries to intervene, the mob savagely kicks and beats him to the ground. Dallas, Texas, October 1980. A sniper takes deadly aim at a crowded Dallas bus. Seconds later, a 30 caliber bullet shatters a passenger window and pierces the skull of eight-year-old Alicia Williams. While Alicia lingers in critical condition, police apprehend and indict a striking transit union militant. And perhaps most tragic of all, Chicago, Illinois, the winter of 1980. For 23 days, firemen stage an illegal strike. They want increased forced unionism powers, so they literally let the city burn. Twenty innocent people die while striking firemen turn their backs or block the paths of those trying to douse the flames. Writes Mary Elson of the Chicago Tribune, 12 of the 20 were children, most too tiny to run from the flames that killed them, all too young to understand words such as strike and union and arbitration. It's terribly frustrating to hear the bloody swath that union violence is cutting across the land today. Jobs are destroyed, homes are wrecked, lives are lost. And all because Congress has granted a handful of union bosses powers of compulsion, carefully kept from the rest of us. But as frustrating as that is, there's yet another face of union violence that's most frustrating of all. In a land which prides itself on equal justice for all, Union terrorists have been made more equal than the rest of us. In a land which boasts of rule of law, special rules have been made for union lawbreakers. In the words of 1974 Nobel laureate, Dr. Frederick Hayek, Unions are uniquely privileged institutions to which the general rules of law do not apply. They have become the only important instance in which governments signally fail in their prime function, the prevention of coercion and violence. What has happened to the Hobbs Anti-Extortion Act provides a perfect case in point. For most Americans, the Hobbs Act makes it illegal to obstruct interstate commerce by acts or threats of violence. But that law doesn't apply to union officials. In a 1973 decision, the nation's highest court exempted union terrorists, saying, This section, which makes it a federal crime to obstruct interstate commerce by robbery or extortion, does not reach the use of violence to achieve legitimate union objectives. 
That's why in Thousand Oaks, California, mobs of Teamster Union militants who stormed Earl Cosby's trucking company and burned the trucks walked away scot-free. They formed a camp out there in that open field. I moved into the warehouse for three months, 24 hours a day, with some of my employees. From that field out there, they shot out windshields. They threw rocks, rotten eggs. They chased and followed us. They attacked uh, one of my employees, sending him to the hospital. They also burned three trucks. One truck, they followed all the way to Connecticut and burned it in our customer's driveway there. From right here in our yard, they followed it to Connecticut and burned it. I myself appeared before the grand jury twice, and five of these Teamsters were indicted. Since that time, the indictments have been dismissed. And if you ask me why they were dismissed, I don't know, because I don't understand any law that would protect these gangsters from, from vandalism and destruction that they cause. Union violence in America is dangerously close to being out of control. Sometimes it seems it could hardly get worse. But it probably will, especially if Congress allows some of those who stand astride the union movement to carry out the threats they've made. William Wimpensinger is the president of the One Million Member Machinist Union. An avowed socialist, Wimpensinger recently declared... In my lifetime, no group has ever gotten justice in this country without lawlessness. So if we want to see change, we may have to stop having such a high regard for law and order. Most union members are repulsed by this kind of talk, but not the union hierarchy. So for decades, union officials and their friends in Congress have killed every attempt to end the special privileges and coercive powers that give union militants their deadly muscle. Only when the American people have joined together to force the hand of Congress have such bills even been given a proper hearing. Well, now it's time to join together again. Right now, there are bills in both the U.S. Senate and the House, which could start to turn the tide against union violence. These companion bills would, for the first time in nearly a decade, amend the Hobbs Act to once again make union violence in interstate commerce a federal offense. For the first time in nearly a decade, Union militants would have to abide by the same anti-extortion laws as the rest of us. And men like Earl Cosby would not have to watch their companies burn while the criminals go free. Now, no one is pretending that these bills could end all the types of union violence we've witnessed in this report. It took Congress and the courts nearly 50 years to put union terrorists this far beyond the law. And frankly, it's going to take more than one bill to cut them down to size. But with your help, we can start to turn things around. With your help, we can amend the Hobbs Act to end some of the suffering caused by union violence. And we can send a message to Washington that it's high time to end the union reign of terror.